So the title of my talk here is Incremental Robot Learning, and uh, I added the uh, subtitle, Don't Throw Out the Baby with the Bathwater, you'll see why. Um, so as uh, I've been listening to the talks so far, um, um, I wrote down a couple of comments that um, I will try to address during this talk. Uh, Jeanette uh, said that it's hard to write the PDL, so therefore we should start from scratch and uh, learn everything. Uh, and also there's a question of what should or could we learn. Uh, and uh, Chris Paxson mentioned that it's in general very hard to uh, uh, reliably determine logical representations of scenes accurately. And Russ mentioned that we should start with feedback primitives and Sergey said that uh, it's important to learn preconditions. And um, I'd like to address uh, uh, some of those things as I go along. So uh, one thing to make clear is that uh, my research goal, and uh, this is joint work with Leslie Cabling, is really to uh, try to make general purpose intelligent robots. So it's uh, different from uh, a kind of robotics goal, which is to do a task very well, uh, you know, narrow task. So uh, the things that we're interested in is things that, you know, are uh, in which uh, are very variable. Uh, for example, if you imagine trying to make tea in any kitchen, that you drop the robot in, that's uh, a huge amount of variability, or the kind of variability where you have to do uh, a lot of different jobs. Uh, so uh, one way of uh, thinking about this space of domains is one is to think about the complexity of the policy from like a, you know, a simple one for doing one task and then a much more complex uh, policy for dealing with uh, a whole range of tasks. And then there's also the uncertainty that the designers have about the domain. So uh, if you work in a narrow task in a known model, uh, classic engineering methods uh, uh, work very well. Uh, you know, uh, Atlas doing parkour is, you know, a remarkable thing, but it, you know, it only really does that one thing. Uh, and uh, if you have a narrow task, but you don't uh, know the models well, then, uh, you know, some kind of uh, a learning based method uh, of, you know, this is just one example, uh, does uh, quite well, and it's really, you know, like the only uh, choice you have. Uh, so uh, the question then uh, is the, this other column of uh, what happens about uh, broad competences. Uh, so when, uh, when you are in a situation in which you uh, have known models, then I think that that's where task conversion planning fits in. I'll comment on that. And then, of course, ultimately, we want to get to a situation in which we uh, want to deal with tasks uh, and have a broad competence, uh, but in, uh, uh, without necessarily knowing the models ahead of time. So, I mean, we, uh, we've talked about robot uh, uh, task and motion planning, and our particular approach to uh, uh, task and motion planning uh, uh, tries to combine sample-based planning uh, as opposed to, say, optimization-based planning. Uh, with uh, strips like planners uh, trying to use the, the, the powerful uh, AI uh, planning systems that uh, exist today. And, and we do this in a way that is not uh, run the uh, strips planner and then run the, the motion planner, but uh, try to do it in an integrated fashion uh, in order to try to get the best of both worlds. One what particular. Would be the, uh, Tomas Lozano Perez. I'm sorry? Did somebody speak? Um, are we okay? I think you can keep going. Okay, so um, uh, one approach to uh, doing the uh, task motion planning in this way uh, is by our student, uh, Kaylin Garrett. Um, and uh, you already saw some of this when Chris Pactron spoke, but uh, his uh, scheme uh, it's called PDL's, PDL stream, and it's a basically trying to uh, reduce uh, task and motion planning to uh, PDL planning uh, uh, by sampling to, in the same way that a uh, uh, classic uh, motion planner uh, reduces uh, motion planning uh, to a graph search by sampling. Uh, it's uh, different what you uh, what you have to sample bec uh, because now you have to sample uh, situations that involve uh, interactions between objects and the robot, uh, but you can create uh, a set of uh, streams which are basically uh, 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 
samplers that can generate values, which you can then use uh, inside your uh, uh, planner, your strips planner, uh, to decide whether you, uh, you have enough values to uh, string them together to construct a plan. Uh, and you can do this uh, uh, iteratively and use guidance from uh, partial results that you've gotten to, to drive the planning. I don't have time to go into details. The important thing about this is that uh, what makes it work is uh, the samplers. Uh, in the typical uh, motion planning uh, domain, the samplers are very simple. They are um, just, uh, you know, uh, sample full configurations. That's not enough. In, in this domain, and, uh, but you can use, uh, for example, uh, inverse kinematics to generate uh, uh, configurations of the robot that are, have particular relationships to objects such as grasping and so on. And in general, you can compose a small number of samplers to construct a set of placements that you need in order to solve, uh, to solve the whole problem. Uh, the, the important message here is that uh, the, these kinds of planners, uh, this is just one example, this applies to most, uh, to pretty much all, all TAP planners, is that they are modular. Uh, and that, uh, because of that, they're actually relatively easy to expand to a new domain. It's not like you have to write, uh, you know, everything from scratch every time you need a new domain. It really is building uh, on top of what you have learned. Uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the PDDL, uh, that needs to be written is uh, uh, generally uh, 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 small uh, as you go to uh, new domains. Uh, now, uh, there are, you know, you, if you have a new type of operation, you do need to uh, address uh, the problem, but uh, the, um, uh, you get an enormous amount of power from composing uh, existing pieces. Uh, and that's what I, I think is an essential part uh, of uh, any enterprise that tries to build an intelligent robot, that it really has to be uh, incremental, that it has to be uh, uh, modular so that you can combine uh, pieces together. Um, and, you know, the, this is actually something that, uh, that Kaelin uh, did at uh, NVIDIA, uh, but I mean, it simply illustrates that you don't want to, when you're doing pick and place, have to uh, uh, teach the robot that in order to put something in, in, in a container, you need to open it and so on and, have, uh, and treat that as a separate uh, uh, operation each time. It really should be something that is uh, an inference and, uh, made uh, from, uh, you know, some, uh, some general uh, information. And, you know, uh, I'm not saying that we absolutely need exact models uh, of, uh, you know, of everything, but the ability to combine what you know about uh, about particular uh, uh, models and particular operations to solve more complicated tasks is essential. Now, one way of thinking about this, which is uh, which is a useful theoretical framework, and I'm not going to go into detail here. This is a, a slide I stole from uh, uh, Lydia Karaki's group. It is a multimodal motion planning. The idea is that there's uh, uh, the, the, you can think about operations in terms of uh, uh, constraints on the motions of the robot and the, motion, and the motions of the objects in the world. Uh, and there's a set of uh, basic relationships that hold between the objects and, 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 uh, and, the obje and the robot, for example, grasping or moving in contact with the surface and so on. And you can break down the, the, the problems that you need to face into a few of these and in our framework, you would need samplers for uh, generating situations, uh, in, uh, configurations of the robot uh, and the objects that are the different interfaces uh, between the different modes. But uh, this, this abstraction is useful in terms of, uh, for example, if you say a situation, this is the meta world suite of RL problems. If you face a whole bunch of situations like this, you can think of them in terms of a relatively few sets of interaction types that occur and uh, can be combined uh, to solve them. So for example, you know, we took that, that set of problems and said, oh, well, let's see what it takes, you know, in order to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get our planner to uh, plan all these tasks. And uh, it, it was interesting, I mean, uh, with basically four types of, uh, you know, operators, we were able to solve 
uh, you know, lots of them, 43 out of, out of 50 of the ones that were listed there without any, you know, any, any fancy, uh, uh, you know, uh, additions to the system. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the ones that, that we couldn't do offhand did require a new type of operation. I mean, some of them require some, some uh, interesting frictional contacts in order to operate. But it does, it does focus uh, on the point that a relatively small set of operations uh, can uh, uh, combine to solve a wide variety of, of problems. The other thing I wanted to, to mention was the, uh, the idea, uh, this, this the issue having to do with uncertainty. So uh, it is not in general a good idea to believe that, that you can uh, uh, accurately determine the state of the world and, and rely on exact descriptions of everything in, in order to do the, uh, you know, to do the planning. Uh, one uh, uh, approach that uh, we have pursued for uh, quite a number of years is this idea of belief space planning. Um, and the idea is that there's a status estimator that is not expected to produce a perfect description, but rather a belief, uh, a, a probability distribution over, diff over states. And then an action selection, which is the planner, and you, wrote, and you close the loop in a kind of MPC type uh, framework. Um, and this can, in fact, be uh, the basis of uh, effective planners that are more robust. I mean, we did some early work uh, in, in this area to, do, to build uh, belief space uh, planners that can deal with uh, a variety of different situations. You know, it's the same code and a, a number of different operations, and they can be done fairly robustly. And uh, the planner plans the perception as well as the actions. And in fact, uh, you saw another example of such a planner built by, by our student Kalen while well, he was uh, uh, at NVIDIA exploiting their, their infrastructure and perception and so on, which reasons about the, you know, its own uncertainty in order to do rather complicated uh, situations that involve planning for the perception as well as the action. So you saw this earlier, I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. But the point is that the, uh, the, this task and motion planning uh, kind of framework uh, can be extended uh, to uh, uh, dealing with uncertainty. And I agree with Russ that uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, picking up the plate operation that he demonstrated is, doesn't come out neatly out of this uh, uh, existing work. But I think it could, it could that the feedback uh, planning uh, framework that he described uh, could actually uh, be implemented and uh, uh, in, the, in this context and uh, used as a basis for, for a more advanced uh, task and motion plan. So then the question uh, comes up, uh, okay, so we're trying to get to this kind of cool robot that can do all kinds of different things in different environments, and how should we go about uh, building it? And, you know, one approach, uh, which is the one that Sergey outlined, basically tries to uh, uh, move the, the, the classic learning, uh, reinforcement learning paradigms in, in this direction, and it's adopting many of the ideas of, um, you know, model-based uh, control, but uh, without explicit uh, represent, uh, representations and, uh, through embeddings and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to outline uh, an alternative view, which is basically to take a task and motion planner uh, and uh, to uh, extend it uh, so that it can uh, uh, deal with uh, new situations uh, uh, via learning. So uh, what, what we've been trying to do is to take some set of assumptions about the world, like, you know, the physical world is made up of 3D, uh, you know, objects with a, with a robot, which is a kinematic linkage, that the perception is reasonably good, not perfect. Uh, and that there are certain basic uh, uh, abilities that we can program in reliably, like uh, roughly pick and place, among other things. Uh, and then the question is, how do we structure a system so that it can be generalized and, uh, and do uh, a broader set of tasks? So the way, the way we, you know, are the architecture that we, do, we adopt is basically uh, uh, made up of a, a number of modules. Uh, there's a percent, you know, there's a control module uh, that basically has a set of sensory motor controllers. These are feedback loops as uh, the, of the kind that, uh, that Russ talked about. 
so uh, trying to do trajectories is not a good idea because they're not robust. So, uh, you know, you have a feedback loop such as, uh, you know, for grasping, you look at the forces. If you, you know, if things don't look right, you move over and so on. So you have a number of sensory controllers uh, that uh, are, are part of your system. There's uh, perception, and so there's object segmenters and feature detectors and so on, and they can be deep or shallow or doesn't matter. There are ways of trying to get uh, uh, basically uh, estimates of the state uh, uh, and uh, ideally with uncertainty as well. Uh, and then uh, in general, you might actually want to actually have partial policies. Uh, uh, you know, for example, if you're going to cook, uh, there's a sequence of actions that you, that, that you follow because you know they will work, not because you can actually deduce them via planning. Uh, and then uh, you need uh, operator models uh, that you can use uh, for uh, uh, sequencing through these, uh, through these, uh, you know, putting them together, uh, uh, putting the actions together. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm going to run out of time, uh, but one of the things that we've been focusing on is how do we uh, acquire models of, uh, of operations uh, so that we can combine them. Uh, and uh, the, the key point is that if I give you a policy uh, which does a particular action, for example, we've been looking at pouring, uh, you do need to characterize the preconditions. You need to characterize the, the situations under which they work. Uh, because if you don't have that, then you don't know how to combine the pieces, as, uh, as, as Sergey said. And what we've been trying to, uh, to do is to take very coarse uh, descriptions of the uh, symbolic preconditions of the, of the actions, and then characterize the, uh, the numerical conditions on the parameters that, are, that uh, guarantee that the operation can be done fairly reliably. Uh, so we, uh, we do that uh, using Gaussian process regression uh, by taking a bunch of examples of the, of the task execution uh, and then uh, at which we actually use the uncertainty estimates in the Gaussian process to guide the choice of, uh, of uh, operations that need to be done uh, so that we can learn uh, a set of con uh, uh, constraint uh, on the uh, parameters of the action uh, that uh, guarantee that we can do a good execution. So, uh, you know, uh, we have the, the robot, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, ridiculous things in the lab, uh, uh, spilling things all over to try to learn uh, operate the, the parameters of the operation. And we do planning uh, during the, the process, so at least we have some chance of it working, as opposed to, uh, you know, just randomly waving the arms around. So uh, uh, with this kind of uh, active robot learning, we, are, uh, we can actually uh, learn these constraints and then exploit them uh, uh, during planning. And it's, you know, better than the, the alternatives. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we can then uh, combine them uh, inside the task and motion planner. So, so here is the robot uh, trying to do, uh, you know, a simple operation, uh, you know, which is supposed to simulate, uh, you know, uh, like making coffee or, or cooking or something. And, it's, uh, and what it's doing is it's combining fluidly the operations uh, that were built in, which are some basic pick and place operations, and also operations that it, was, that it learned, such as pouring. Uh, and this is actually using uh, perception online to uh, locate the objects and, and so on. So, uh, it's it's very flexible to uh, it's as far as the arrangement of objects ahead of time. It's not like it's going to work only for for one for one set of uh, uh, you know one setup. Uh, so uh, we've been you know uh, uh, basically building up uh, a a uh, this kind of architecture, and in addition to learning, uh, for example, sensory motor controllers for new operations. One of the other directions uh, which we've been pursuing is also learning control knowledge, so that if you do uh, the operation multiple times, you'll get uh, you'll get better uh, at doing it. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, another useful direction uh, for uh, you know in, in terms of the question of what to learn. Uh, so uh, yeah, our student uh, Bam Jun King has been working on learning both at the level of the high level actions uh, for, a, uh, for a situation as well as the low level actions. 
uh, and the key objective in, in, and what makes this hard is, is a kind of learning uh, that uh, generalizes to uh, 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 to very different application domains uh, and very different situations. I don't have time to talk about that, uh, but uh, so let me just get to my last slide here. Um, so this is joint work with Leslie Kebling and our students, Zi Wang and Kaylin Garrett, Ban Jun King and Luke Shimanuki, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>